Well, welcome everybody to uh, this presentation. This is a presentation on value stream mapping. You know, my name is Paul Jacinto and I'm part of the uh, International Business Consultants Group that's putting these uh, series of webinars together. So yeah, um, you're in the right place if you wanted to hear about value streams in general and what value, st value stream mapping is and how to, how to leverage that for your company or teams. So uh, before I, I get into the content, uh, I'm just curious, you know, if you wanna just respond in the chat, I'm watching the chat right now. Is there anyone currently leveraging val the concept of value streams at their company? Or is this like something you're considering and doing some uh, investigation and exploration to, to bring it back to your leadership team? All right. Okay. Cool. Thank. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. You. You guys are. You're, you guys are considering Jim also. Okay. I got a message from someone saying uh, we tried it before, but it went badly. <laughs> okay. That. That's cool. I. You know. Me too. I've. I've been part. I've been a part of some uh, really um, poor value stream uh, experiments at a couple companies. Uh, let's see. Just looking at the chat here, it looks like Rod, uh, you, you guys are prepping and helping the client implement it. Okay, cool. So hopefully you get some cool takeaways. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna link to some vendors and some uh, diagramming uh, tools that could help you build these uh, for your clients. Okay, and then Steve, this is a, this will be a refresh. Well, cool. Um, yeah, I, I view value stream as an art. So whatever I present here, if it's different, than any than how you guys implemented it. Uh, what makes these presentations lively is uh, kind of a, a difference of, of uh, how to approach things. So yeah, feel free to interrupt me and uh, you know provide some additional context for uh, how you guys did it. So okay, let's let's go ahead and get into it. Value stream mapping. Uh, this is what we'll cover. Um, we'll cover a little bit of, about um, you know value stream mapping and lean principles. Uh, Definitely, there's a tight affinity there and overlapping. Uh, I'm definitely going to give you some example value streams in the software domain. So if you're working in an IT department or building a software for your uh, solution or service, uh, this is one you could actually copy and paste and just uh, update the metrics that are tracked to uh, help you find the bottlenecks. And then, of course, we'll cover the basics of what uh, what is a value stream, um, what is a value stream map, and how, how does that how does that relate to value streams in general? And then uh, definitely we'll cover the benefits. And so at the end of this presentation, I would love for you guys to come away with these takeaways. Um, a value stream map, in its simplest form, is just a, a it's a form of documentation, really. Um, it's it's visual in that uh, because it's visual, really highlights. Uh, the biggest bottlenecks in your sequence of steps where you take an idea or concept to your customer or marketplace. So if you're in a leadership leadership position where um, you're being tasked with, hey, let's let's do things quicker, let's uh, let's provide additional value to our customers faster, then yeah, you know, I hope you come away with this presentation with some ideas for reducing uh, you know the cost, overall cost of the project, lead time, and hopefully defects. So yeah, I believe every presentation is incomplete unless there's uh, some kind of fancy quote. So finding one for this topic, um, there's a lot of good ones out there, but I landed on one from Edwards Deming and, and I'll just read it word for word here. Um, Create constants of purpose toward improvement of product and service with the aim to become competitive and to stay in business and to provide jobs. So um, that that's not the the tightest of quotes, but uh, to me, when I read that, the first thing that comes to mind is continuous improvement, and it's in every company's best interest to try to optimize how they deliver value to the customer. So this idea of continuous improvement and you know remaining competitive and you know staying in staying in business, especially in this economic climate, 
Um, I am seeing a lot more pings on uh, value stream mapping. You know, I, I get pinged via email about this topic um, more now than I did uh, 18 months ago. So yeah, my feeling is the marketplace is really uh, embracing this as a technique. Okay, so let's let's keep it going. Let's let's cover the basics first. Value, huh, and I, I see the typo there. I will correct that. But that's supposed to say what is a value stream? A value stream is uh, you know essentially it's not to overcomplicate things. It's just the list of uh, activities and the the people that do those activities that take an idea or concept. Um, and realize it as a product or solution for your customer. So, you know, I work at a lot of companies that have, you know, the traditional silos, everything's broken down by functional uh, departments. And so this, the concept of a value stream is a very disruptive concept. So, you know, when you build a product, the, the value in the building of that product cross cuts across all the different functional departments. So that's that's actually the value stream or the value stream network. So, um, you know, if you're in the agile space, you may have heard of uh, this concept of oh, let's scale agile. So the scaled agile framework has taken this concept and they've uh, put some fancy buzzwords around it. So in uh, scaled agile, a value stream is uh, essentially an agile release train. You know, that's a, a, a big part of the value stream network. So uh, more concretely, um, if when you're thinking about value streams, you know, I mentioned, yeah, it's uh, if you're in a traditional siloed organization, it's really the cross cutting of all the, the teams required to produce a product or service and get it out the door. But, um, you know, I, I think this slide could help contextualize things as well. So really, it's the people, uh, the culture of the organization, uh, the tools and technologies you're, you're tied to uh, organizationally. It's the behaviors of the leadership, uh, the people within the teams itself. Um, I know a lot of people are really remote these days, but really the, the physical offices uh, used to be good delineations of the, the silos uh, in big companies. How about the uh, policies and procedures and uh, the overall hierarchy of an organization. So I, I have the word social system there that supports the value stream. Uh, to, to me, that uh, another way to say that is your organizational hierarchy. So your, your directors, senior VPs, all the way up to the C-suite, you know, that's, that's also part of your value stream. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, to me, the value, what really makes a value stream is the, the tight communication network or channels. So if you, if you were to document how information flows to build your products, that is a good clue to what your value streams are within your company. So let, let me stop here. Um, and I'd, I'd love to get some feedback from our audience. Um, is this concept of a value stream, is it uh, understood where you currently work? And, and is it something you guys are leveraging today? I'd say kind of, sort of. Um, I think it, the complexity of defining the value stream uh, is challenging for some. <clears throat> Particularly, I'm working with the ERP. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's massive. I guess you'd say there's a macro value stream with multiple nested value streams. So it's just identifying those value streams to form the art that seems to be a challenge. So just share the frustration. No, that's uh, well, thank you for sharing that because it kind of um, it uh, validates some of the, the the clients I've been working with in the last couple of years. They all have the same issue. They, they don't know where to begin. And so we'll we'll cover some ideas to, to help with that. But uh, okay, let's go ahead and move on. Here, here's some other things to consider um, with your value streams. You know, like I mentioned, your organizational hierarchy um, and actually the culture underneath, um, you know, what people see in terms of titles, um, how you, what you reward at your company also determines 
you know, what, what behaviors um, and what's tolerated at a company. So like to me, you're either, a company's either coaching or condoning uh, good and bad behavior. So uh, that topic doesn't really get a lot of play, but um, you know, I've seen enough of, uh, as a consultant, I've seen enough implementations to know that, yeah, it's really what the company uh, rewards kind of drives the culture uh, within, within these value streams. Um, a couple of things I, I want to touch on on this slide. Uh, communication. So I have, I have the word chartage in parentheses here. That, that's just a, an old school word for uh, oh, your, your dashboards, your metrics, your, your, your reports. So uh, kind of visualizing and, and when, we, when we pivot to value stream mapping, you'll see that that, that is a very visual tool and a very useful tool to uh, come back to every quarter to see if our bottlenecks are getting worse or getting better. So uh, yeah, I wanted to touch on a couple of these soft skill topics because uh, they don't really get a lot of play. Uh, most people just focus on the uh, who are the teams involved, what technologies are we using, and uh, you know that that kind of stuff. So okay, before we move on to value stream mapping, um, any questions about value streams before we move on? Because yeah, there's a you know if you understand the concept of value streams, even though you don't formally recognize them at your company, um, you guys actually do have a value stream. It's just whether or not it's uh, talked about in the open and under, well understood. So, okay, let's pivot to, to the mapping part. So yeah, mapping is just uh, value stream mapping. It's really, it's really just documentation. Like I said earlier, it's the tool that documents the flow of uh, information or um, the resources to build out whatever service or solution you're uh, pushing out to the marketplace. And what makes it valuable is the bottom part of the slide. Once you've mapped out your value stream, um, that means you you baselined metrics like cycle time and uh, uh, percent complete and accuracy. Uh, once that's built, you you actually use that to identify here are the areas in our value stream where we need to make a change or to optimize. And make a change usually usually means we're going to eliminate waste uh, or maybe add a process to make something downstream work a little bit more efficient. So yeah, we'll we'll get into that. You know, I, I like to show a visualization of a value stream, you know, early in, into the presentation so people get a sense of what it is. So this, you know, when you do this exercise, you're going to you're going to produce two documents, uh, one value stream map for the current process. And then the second thing is your future state and then your future state that's always evolving. So if you revisit this every quarter you're making judgment calls or providing funding to optimize uh, various bottlenecks in this flow. So this is a very simple software value stream map. And it's, uh, it's complete, except for there's a, you know, in this screenshot, I, I clipped off the summary, which will be in a, a future slide uh, a couple minutes from now. But uh, between this definition and now actually seeing what it looks like, how does this land for you guys? Um, is this something, you know, when I ask this question, usually people say, we have this information, but we don't have the, the metrics at the bottom, which is really the, really the meaty part and what drives improvement at the company. So who, who's not, uh, well, who is, who is actually documenting the steps and the, the teams involved, plus uh, baselining metrics like lead time, value added time and quality assessments. And then I'll just uh, take a look at the chat while you guys uh, take a moment there. Well, when you say value added time, are you talking about uh, cycle time? Um, well, that, like, I, I define cycle time as the lead time plus the value added time. Ah. So you, you know, if you Google this topic, you may see value added time referred to as processing time or PT. 
Okay. So yeah, if you're on scaled agile, they, they don't use, they don't use VAT, they use PT instead. Okay. And yeah, a lot of this comes from Six Sigma. So if you're on scaled agile's website and you're looking at this, you're like, man, this is just uh, they borrowed a ton from uh, Six Sigma. So, and yes, scaled agile is pretty, uh, pretty open about that. They, they say we, we take the best from all the different uh, project management techniques. So, okay, uh, if there's no questions now, we'll, we'll keep it going. All right, so what, what are the benefits? Why go through this uh, documentation? Why go through the trouble? Um, well, to me, the, the bullet at the bottom is really the most important one for me. It's, it's really building a, you know, that blueprint, that visual blueprint, which enables the business. Like, I think business people really love this document. Even though it's a flow chart, they actually really dig it because um, it reduces all the day-to-day -day stuff into high-level blocks. And there's uh, a few metrics associated to each block, right? So they get the flow um, and then the, con the lean concepts related to uh, cycle time and uh, value added time are um, you know, quickly explained in, in a one pager. And then outside of that, it's a, a common way for really large companies to, uh, to do some analysis on how uh, solutions get built, right? I think that's important. Um, in my last couple of years of the consulting, like it seems to me the bigger the company, the the more valuable this common language is. Everyone's got their own way of documenting how stuff works. And believe it or not, believe it or not, some of the biggest companies I've worked with, uh, there's not one person that knows how their organization <laughs> delivers value. It's you, you got to talk to like two or three people to get the full story. So I think that's where value stream mapping is uh, becoming very popular, right? Companies want to get this down on paper because of, uh, you know, if those two or three people all of a sudden left, I mean, uh, they'd be uh, they'd be, be in a lot of trouble. And then, yeah, definitely because it's visual and there's metrics there, you can easily see what the bottleneck is. And we'll do an example of that later. So I do want to touch on customer value. Um, doing this effort, doing the mapping, um, it's not difficult, but it's, it's nice to have this overriding um, idea that we're doing this effort, like if you had to pitch this to upper management to, to put the, uh, the time and effort into this, uh, this is really about driving customer value. So, you know, this slide is basically saying, yeah, um, if we can express value with respect to timing and how much it costs to deliver that value, uh, we can make better decisions, you know, mid-year, not just at the end of the year when we're thinking about, okay, how much budget are we going to gonna use for the next fiscal year, right? This is an ongoing thing. Um, I treat it as a living document that we uh, we need to revisit every quarter. And then more on value. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, you know, I'm borrowing a lot from uh, Six Sigma. So I'm using val this idea of value added time, but what, you know, what, what is value actually? Um, so I've got a couple of, yeah, I got three questions here that can help you determine if something is a value add. Um, you know, is this step pushing us closer to what the customer needs? That's a very valid question. Uh, is what we're doing now enhancing our current product or service? I think that, that's a key question to answer. And then th that last one, it's kind of a trick question, but uh, is it rework? So how you answer this determines whether it's a value add or not. So any guesses out there? Is it re if, if something is labeled as something that had to be reworked, is that considered a value add, you know, to the customer? Yeah, the the answers are in the next couple of slides. So yeah, I'll take some guesses. What, what do you guys think? No, <clears throat> I wouldn't want to pay for rework or have the price 
of rework factored into the the price of the product or service I'm paying for. That's what I right. Said. Yeah. 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 Right. Right on. So rework is considered, you know, so it depends on the the what macro level you're looking at. If it's an escaped defect, definitely it's called, you know, definitely not value add. So, um, you know, yeah, before we get into a, a deeper discussion on that, a couple more things on value. Um, and I'm just going to cover these as like, oh, this is kind of summarizing how to work in a lean fashion. Uh, you know, work in a pull system, you know, measure baseline these metrics like uh, cycle time and value added time to optimize flow. Uh, make sure the people doing the work are aware of what value stream and what products, um, you know, how their work contributes to the final product. And uh, make sure everyone understands you know, how their daily work connects back to the customer. So uh, that feels like common sense, but a lot of people, if you talk to a QA person, they're not, they're not so connected to, to value in that sense. So I think there's some opportunities uh, there, guys. And then that bottom bullet there, manage towards perfection. Um, you're never gonna get to perfection, but uh, you know, we, we wanna have that mindset in terms of Okay, we, we see some issues in the value stream map, like our uh, our defect rate is so high, uh, it's high enough to where man we we want to dedicate resources to cleaning that up and uh, you know get our defect numbers down. So th the opposite of value would be uh, something wasteful. So yeah, the the question from uh, two slides back is rework considered value? Well, no, it's not in terms of a lean context, it's considered a uh, you know, waste. So the seven sources of wasteful activities are, you know, this just comes straight from uh, lean, over-processing, having uh, too much work in progress. So that means your, your batch sizes are, are too big. Um, excess inventory. So that, that could, in a software sense, I, I get asked this question, what, is that, what does excess inventory mean? It, well, it could mean that you're, you've got a really massive backlog that is like two years wide or two years long. So um, yeah, that's considered excess um, inventory and that should be trimmed down to uh, you know, at least uh, six months or less. Unnecessary movement, that comes more from manufacturing uh, wait time, or idle time, yeah, I think that applies to both software and uh, manufacturing as well. Overproduction and of course defects, right? Um, I'm assuming that people that come to this are um, managing software projects. Um, and if that's the case, I think number seven is like the big one, overprocessing. Um, another way I like to phrase this is it's really thrashing and churn between two different groups. So you've got QA downstream receiving work from your development team. If there's a lot of back and forth between QA and dev, you know, they keep finding things that developers should have accounted for. Yeah, that's, that's considered over-processing and um, quality uh, thrashing. So yeah, that, uh, that could be a clue that there's a disconnect between what the developers think they need to build and what the QAs are testing against. So. Uh, yeah, there. Uh, that's uh, an opportunity. Hey, uh, hey Paul. Oh hey. yeah, sure. So uh, this work in progress, how it can be, uh, you know, treated as a waste. To work in progress is status, right? Um, well, yeah, I, it's an incomplete bullet. So I said excess work in progress. So if your team has five developers, but you know, if you look at the Kanban board, there's like seven user stories in progress. That that means uh, they're. Uh, they're not honoring honoring uh, whip constraints, work in progress constraints, or the, maybe they don't even have that defined, right? Okay. So yeah, um, you want to make sure your your whip constraints are tuned to the number of people uh, that can do work on that. Okay. So I, I always recommend n minus one. So if you've got five developers, I would set a whip limit of four. And you know why? Why would I want to leave out one of the developers? Because I I treat that fifth person, or it's not always the same person either. From sprint to sprint, there's at least one person that can help, um, either with pair programming or help with the QA effort. Because uh, 
QA is usually a bottleneck and you know, having that one extra developer there, he, he could focus on things like automation, right, instead of feature work. So, uh, yeah, work in progress is a, is a big one. Hey, Paul, mm -hmm. um, yeah. this is useful. So, rework, number one, right? So, I, I can understand rework related to defect may be a waste, a waste. But, but what about, you know, refactoring? Oh, yeah, refactoring. Um, you know, in, in its purest form, it's it is. I would consider that rework, but it's over a longer time horizon. But uh, you know, if I don't mind classifying that as an enhancement because it's an enhancement to how it how we maintain the solution in the future. So if we write better quality code that's easier to modify because we've uh, we write smaller methods, that enhances the you know how we enhance it in the future in, in terms of how quickly we can modify it or um you know, i'm having trouble coming up with the words but uh yeah it, it's in a main you know it's uh maintenance is something that's not uh, thought about too much so yeah if you have better quality code by refactoring uh, yeah you can enhance things quicker and get to market faster so that wouldn't be considered a waste right i'm i'm just trying to no, no I, I wouldn't consider that waste. So yeah, I, I was very careful not to put the word refactor there. So yeah, rework in terms of, you know, we push something to the marketplace that okay. is broken on like day okay. zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I consider, yeah, I consider refactoring a very worthy um, activity. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Okay, so we're clear. We, we, you know, we've got a good concept of value, and the opposite of value is waste. So, yeah, where where do you start with this journey of documenting your your value stream? Uh, well, what I've attempted to document here is uh, a really big enterprise company, right? So you've got uh, the enterprise at the top, and then you've got your operational people that maintain what you push out to your your customers and then uh, you got the people in the middle that uh, are defining the work making uh, scope trade-offs and actually doing the development and the qa work so they they usually land right at the uh, the bottom part right where they these are the guys doing the execution so you know i would start there um but you know you start here but also have your customer and you know, external um, factors in mind, like uh, vendors and suppliers. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. So start locally. Like if I'm on it, you know, so, if I'm uh, on, on the previous slide. So the yeah, value stream is above the enterprise or you're saying the three layers, right? The value stream can be treated as uh, above the enterprise, right? Well, it, it depends. No, well, I would say it depends. You can build a value stream from the very, very top. So where you you've got uh, this very complicated intake process, and you're you're um, you're bidding for uh, you're you're creating a bidding war between suppliers. Um, I'm saying like try to eliminate that noise and start at a lower level. Okay. And kind of work backwards from the customer. So. I think starting with your operations level is a good place to start because they're the ones, you know, pushing the enhancement to the market. And if you work backwards from that and your customer, um, I think you'll have an easier time building out your your value stream. Okay. Okay. And yeah, so so yeah, you, you basically start start at the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. And just start documenting your your high level processes. So my advice here is not to get so granular where you're you're documenting what a team is doing within a two week sprint. I think that's too granular. You know, I I would take a, a higher level view and say within a quarter, this is the these are the high level steps required to bring an idea from the business into into the market. So, yeah, not, not so granular where you're looking day to day or sprint to sprint, but uh, I think quarter to quarter is a good place to start. 
and start just start with high level processes like what I recommend is you you just start naming processes on a spreadsheet like each line item. Uh, you, you think of the processes and don't don't burden yourself with uh, what I have in red here don't worry about information flow communications um, hierarchy uh, uh, functional silos within the company. Uh, don't think about uh, who my who the senior VP is for that part of the organization. Um, you know, there's a there's an opportunity to document those things in your value stream. But when you're starting out, just think about pure process. So you're you're talking about the business process, right? Business process. Or... I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking about both, right? So. I know right here it says operations level, but you know all these uh, everything that gets pushed to production or to the market uh, comes from some business unit level. Okay. Okay. So yeah, there, there's uh, there's going to be some overlap there, for sure. And actually, in my example value stream, I took you know I've got a couple steps that address that uh, at, in a very high level. So okay. Start with process, um, but information flow is important, but uh, don't tackle it first, get to it later. Um, and when you do tackle it, this is uh, an approach that, that could help you, right? Um, I mean, you're gonna have to document the, the information flow from you know, start to finish. So really what, what's helped me in the last couple of uh, uh, consulting engagements is you know working with uh, the QA people. So usually a QA manager, um, because he has to do integration testing, he actually understands um, the various systems that have to work together to productionize a solution or a product. So uh, your your lead QA people, your lead integration people, uh, can really help you in this regard. Um, you know, outside of that. Um, yeah, don't. Uh, I know it's overwhelming. You, you might be thinking, "Man, I got to talk to like ten different people to get this information." But uh, you know, if you start at the high, at a high enough level with the right uh, manager who's receptive and open to to sharing that information, uh, you should be good. And then at the bottom here, I've I've got this uh, idea of uh, go go walk to it. They call that uh, there's a Japanese word for it. Uh, I believe it's gemba. You know, go to where the the where the work is being done, go walk there, go um, go interview the people, see how the work is done. And so my advice there for that uh, information flow, uh, talking to the QA leads is uh, a great, great resource. And then outside of that, uh, some three rules that could help you uh, in this journey. Um, you know, like I said, go, go Gemba, right? Go understand, go get that empathy for the the integration QA folks. They usually know because uh, they, they're usually considering, OK, what data do I need to validate that this is in compliance, right? Uh, developers, um, maybe not so much. They're more focused on the enhancement. Talk to the people um, in, in this remote world. I get asked, how do I do that? <laughs> um, well, you can do it remotely. It's I mean, it's not as cool, but uh, this first bullet, go to the actual place where the process is performed. To me, uh, remotely, that means just um, inviting yourself to some of those meetings, like, um, and just just listen. And when you go to these meetings, it, it's just better to just get a sense of what what problems they're trying to solve and developing that empathy. And then after that, talking to them. So the second point, yeah, talking talking to the actual people. Um, and I recommend, again, talking to a high level manager first and then talking to, to the guys on the floor, you know, doing the QA validation. So crashing meetings, talking with the high level people and then just watching how the how these groups actually get the work out the door. So understanding the uh, I'm afraid to say it because I work in the agile space, but uh, change advisory boards like if you attend a lot of big companies still have them. I attend them and you know, just by watching and observing, you can see where the bottlenecks are um, in that uh, push to production. So how do, how do these tricks or rules uh, land for you guys? Is, is this uh, something you, you think would be helpful?
Yeah, this is great, Paul. Thank you. Okay, cool. And I know it feels like common sense, but uh, man, I've just, uh, in the last five years, uh, these are the three rules that still, uh, like on day one, I can, I can crash these meetings and just get so much good information to build out these maps. Okay, great. Let's, let's keep it going. So, okay, we, we covered value, we covered waste, we covered uh, where to begin, begin with uh, the, the processes from an operational perspective and then work backwards to the development team and then to the business teams. Uh, so you, you've done all that work, you've, you've taken notes. Okay, how do you wanna build out your map? So uh, I'm showing this slide just to show you, you know, if you Google this, you'll see a document uh, that's fully fleshed out, but here's the skeletal parts of a value stream map, right? So usually the customers represented here and, you know, any of these lines represent uh, communication or information sharing between uh, two entities. And the, the map that I'm going to show you at the end is really focused on the, the activities or the sequence that uh, documents the process of getting something to market. And then don't don't sleep on this part. This to me, the, the summary block at the bottom is really um, one of the most important components of a value stream map. And I've got a, I've got a finished one at the uh, near the end of the presentation. We'll we'll pick it apart together. So okay, so just to put a bow on the last couple of minutes uh, of the presentation. Uh, when you're doing this for the first time, you know, where do you start? You know, I would start here, start with a particular service or product family. You know, go ahead and document. So you're, you're, gonna, you're going to document how things work today. That is your current, uh, your current state value stream map. You know, once it's documented, it's not really, uh, it's not shown very well here, but the gap between, the time gap between current and future state, uh, you're measuring that in months sometimes. Um, sometimes half years or uh, even 12 to 18 months, depending on the company. Um, you know, typically the, the smaller the company, the faster you can implement some improvements if everyone's bought in. But uh, yeah, don't, uh, don't think that this will happen within a quarter or two. But uh, you should be revisiting your map every quarter just to see if you're getting worse or getting better. And then the whole key thing is to, uh, because you revisit this, notice the, the cycle here, uh, current state, future state, you're, you're, you're constantly looking at this every, you know, um, at least four times a year. If you're not creating some improvement action items, you know, from that in, uh, retrospection, uh, yeah, you're, you're missing an opportunity to, to make some huge gains in uh, efficiency. So continuous improvement. I've got the word Kaizen here, which is a, another Japanese term that I, I believe it literally means continuous Correct. improvement. <laughs> so, <Correct. laughs> so yeah, it's a little redundant, but uh, and it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt to, to, to have that mindset. And then, okay, and then to sum up, you know, what do you do at the process level? Where do you begin? Um, so I have, I have this term here, door-to-door -door level. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I don't mean it literally uh, in a, these remote days, but door-to-door uh, -door just means your local level, your local context. So if you're in an organization of a, a couple hundred people, I would start there. And then eventually you'll understand what are the codependencies with other parts of the organization. And that's where you move down to this level, multi-location level. And then some companies are across uh, international time zones. So, so yeah, start, start at the process level, understand that, identify the groups within your local organization, and then move up from there. And yeah, I, I've done this personally myself. Um, it is possible for one person to take the lead on documenting and, you know, I, I include other people uh, in the interview process to help, you know, take notes, but, uh, you know, you could assign this uh, 
to one person to make it their deliverable at the end of the quarter to say, okay, at the end of Q1 of 2023, uh, we're going to have a value stream map that's uh, ready to be uh, improved upon. Okay, cool. And I just feel like I had to include this slide. So, um, you know, if you Google value stream mapping, you'll see a bunch of standard uh, looking icons. Um, I don't know if these are standards, but I, I've seen them enough to say, you know, I think this slide would help you if you, if you just knew what they stood for. So in this JAG D1 customer supplier, this jagged arrow is information flow. Uh, this square, you know, um, blue and white arrow means, you know, if you're building physical products, um, you know, it's how widgets flow through the system. Like, I think for all intents and purposes, this process block and the associated metrics are the ones where you're going to spend the most time in terms of, okay, who do I have to interview? What questions do I need to ask? Could I get this out of like JIRA? Is it possible? Is that, you know, is that valid? Um, okay, cool. And you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, if you talk to like the lead of the QA department at a company, you know, he, he's definitely going to give you a running start on um, data and information flow. Um, you know, certainly uh, resources, what contractors we work with, uh, you know, that that stuff you're going to have to get from upper management. Same thing with suppliers and the bigger the company. Um, the more you're going to get process sequences by talking to those senior director level types, sometimes even senior VPs. So, I, you know, I'm just kind of my intent with this slide is to give you guys a head start on who to talk to when you're when you're trying to decide who who do I need to interview to this week <laughs> to get this information. OK, I do I do want to touch on metrics, so. And I, I am using some of the, you know, most of the Six Sigma uh, nomenclature. Uh, Scaled Agile has renamed some of these, but uh, I think we could stick with these because they're tried and true. Lead time, value added time, percent complete and accurate. That is a quality assessment. So um, let's say I've got two processes, process A and B. So B is downstream from A, right? They, they accept work from A. This percent complete and accurate just means um, how complete is this work to where I could just use it as is without requesting process A to make an, a, um, to make an adjustment or to fix a bug. So between dev and QA, like I said, that thrashing, that over-processing. Um, so if QA says, man, I find defects that should have been caught in development, you know, not eight times out of 10, the percent complete and accurate would, you know, I would document that as it's only 20% ready to use at that point. And this roll, rolled percent complete and accurate is just the, um, the aggregate of all the uh, percent CNAs across your value stream map. Activity ratio, that's your, uh, that divided by cycle time or, or lead time if you want to simplify it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to the next slide here, but before I do that, I want to touch on this idea of a timeline. You saw it in my previous example, but uh, the timeline is showing you lead time and processing time or that time. And just seeing those plotted like on a chart like this just uh, really helps contextualize like uh, I really love to see the lead times here. So let, let's say you're new to this, but you, you have an instinct for you have an intuition for man the the process that has the largest lead time probably <laughs> represents something we should spend some budget and money on to improve um, so given this example which which step or which process step would you select for uh, as a candidate to receive some funding to improve yeah java Got a lead time 144 hours versus everything else. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, th this step here, but this lead time actually refers to the lead time for the deployment. Okay. So the Java guys, they have 26 hour lead time, oh. which is still, you know, 
that's not too bad. It's, it's about a day, but this one certainly. So, so what this means, how do you translate this for a business? Well, you tell them our development team can create, uh, they can build and get something ready for production uh, in uh, X number of hours, but it sits in a queue for 144 hours before our deployment team can do anything with it. And, you know, I believe we should invest some, some effort and some energy here because the, the processing time is just uh, 30 minutes, but the, the lead time, another way to say this is idle time. It's just sitting idle for 144 hours before, uh, for 30 minutes of work. So that, 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 uh, that activity ratio is really bad for this step. And not necessarily sitting idle, but there might be um, some, you know, I'm going to say, processes that <laughs> someone's looking at the code, reviewing the code, and so on and so forth, and they're not doing anything else with it. Yeah, ab absolutely. So yeah, I, I just made an assumption that was idle time, but yeah, mm -hmm. there could be there could be micro or uh -huh. um, undocumented steps here that contribute right. to that lead time. Yeah, that's the so. first place to look when you say, okay, what's going on in that 144 hours or the six days? So. Yeah. Yeah, right on. And yeah, so honestly, it doesn't make sense to spend a ton of time on um, this step here, which has a lead time of just 12 hours between uh, the intake and the uh, prioritization of the work. You know, that that's the business side of things. So yeah, uh, with limited resources, tackle the, the biggest bottlenecks in the process. So, okay, that, this, this is an example of a current state map. So, yeah, I want to dwell a little bit on this box here on the lower right-hand corner. Um, yeah, I said it was one of the more important ones, right, because it's actually summarizing your metrics. So the total lead time for this, you know, imaginary project is uh, 243 hours and a, a total uh, value-added processing time of 26 hours. So 26 hours of value-added work to 243 hours of lead time, that ratio, uh, if we can improve that ratio so that the lead time is reduced, um, yeah, we'll have a better value delivery to our customers. And then percent rolled complete and accurate, it's 24%. And uh, I, I usually get asked this, how, how did they get that number? Um, you just multiply all the numbers for each one of these steps for percent CNA. So literally 77% times 81% times 70, 82, 77, and 86. That gives you a final rolled up um, accuracy score of 24%. So you can see the further you get away from 100%, it compounds, right? So your, your percent CNA is 24%. That, uh, that means there's a lot of room here to get better. So, okay, so with that, with that said, let's flip over to, let's say, okay, they identified the bottleneck, they spent six months working on it, and six months later, they've come up with this future state value stream map. This is how it is today from six months ago. So in this one, notice it's, there's, a, there's three new steps. They've, you know, everything with this green or this yellow dot represents a new step that wasn't there six months ago. And, you know, very neatly, there are arrows to signify, you know, is this a decrease in time from six months ago or three months ago, or is there an increase? So, uh, so yeah, notice they've added steps for um, logging in enterprise level uh, software like Datadog. They've added, looks like they've decoupled some test automation and deployment and, you know, and improved that lead time by quite a bit there for the deployment to prod. So that, that's good news. And so, you know, if you don't want to get into the weeds, you could just compare the, the summary box here between the future state and the uh, previous state. So for the future state, imagine six months later, the total lead time uh, improvement is 188 hours. 188 versus 243 that that's that's a big decrease in time and the total value added time is 19 and a half hours to 26 so yeah that's 
you know, I'm, I'm not looking for specific improvements. I just want to see a trend towards improvement. So that, that's my approach as a consultant. And the best way to do that is you actually have to document this stuff. So um, like I said, it's a living document, you know, evolves over time. I would sort of archive these after every quarter, after every review, so that you, you do have a historical record of how things are getting better or worse. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul, I'm sorry to disturb. So oh, yeah, no worries. The, I guess the wait times that are mentioned in the boxes, they are in minutes and then below on the timeline yeah. they're mentioned in hours. Yeah, I'm glad you caught that. Um, so yeah, that, that's a mistake on my part. I was messing around and I'm going to change those back to hours. So um, yeah, typically you want, you want to use the same unit of time um, when you're uh, doing your ratios. Um, so yeah, it would be incorrect if uh, you were comparing minutes to hours uh, when you're doing your, your ratio. Mm -hmm. And the activity ratio is the value added time over the total lead time, right? Yeah, you, that's, that's the simple calculation. You could, you could take value added time divided by cycle time, which is just lead time plus value added time. But um, you could just stick with lead time. Uh, as long as you do it the same for for all the calculations in your map you'll you'll be okay so yeah processing time or vat time divided by lt so uh, okay cool and yeah i want to leave time for questions so i'm just going to summarize uh, just super quickly this is a lot more complicated than it actually is so you want to start with, at the process level uh, make sure you've got the customer in mind when you're drawing up your uh, value stream map, um, you know you want to focus on your process flows, and then uh, then after the fact, add your communication flows, and then make sure you you baseline your metrics like lead time, cycle time, VAT time, and your percent complete and accurate. So once you've done that, you've got you're halfway there. You've got your current state map. You uh, you do your continuous improvement kaizen inspect and adapt activities and then over time you should see improvement like like in this example and th this is of course made up um but uh before i open it up to questions you know i will say are these numbers do they need to be accurate like how i mean because it seems like they're very precise right 26 hours and my guidance, or when I do this, I, I typically don't. Like, I don't go to JIRA and start creating this complex Python program to uh, calculate the exact cycle time for this user story. I don't do that. I actually, um, I just talk to uh, the development managers and the operations people, and I just get their scientific wild ass guess or swag. So you could do, if you just base this current state on swag, you'll actually be fine, right? Because there, there's swags over time. It, it all just, uh, you know, it's really just more about the trend in improvement. Now, now like eight months from now, you'll, you'll probably want to back that up with Jira data. But honestly, if you're getting better, the business is going to notice, yeah, we're, we're actually, our cadence of releases is getting quick is getting better and the quality is actually improving uh, because the amount of uh, escape defects is going down. So yeah, you, you don't have to dig into historical JIRA data, just uh, work with, uh, interview the right people and get their sense for uh, some of these uh, lead times. And if you talk to the right people, they'll, they'll be pretty close, you know. Okay, and okay. So when you, uh, if you're a scaled agilist, there's actually, they've updated their value stream mapping canvas. So uh, this is the new look of it. And all it did was combine the business context with the value stream mapping. So, uh, and then if you're interested in tooling, what, what tools, you know, could you use to build this nice, nicely and neatly? Um, the examples I used were built in Lucid app. So Lucid actually has value stream templates and it's free to sign up. So you could just use Lucid to start out. 
If you want something more enterprise grade, uh, Capstera and Linear B seem to be more uh, geared towards the bigger enterprises. But be because of that, they're very expensive. <laughs> so Lucid's free eDraw is a free download. And in my research, these two companies I've never heard of, but they seem to offer uh, ways to, to track your value stream. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up to some questions. So I have a question. So I actually have a lot of questions as always. Oh, so yeah. as far as the VSM artifact, who would you recommend uh, be the owner per se or manage this document from a safe context? Oh, or, from Yeah, from safe context. Um, yeah, traditionally, or uh, in my experience, I put that on the RTE and it seems to have worked. Uh, because, you know, they, they kind of lead all the retro ceremonies at the end of the PI. And at the Inspect and Adapt, not only can they cover the, predict, the predictability trends, they can also uh, throw this value stream map up and uh, go through uh, each one of these steps to see if they got better or worse. So this one's nice, right, because I've color-coded arrows. to. The, so if someone's just glancing at this, they could see, okay, we actually improved with our uh, JIRA intake and Java development because lead times are down. And, oh, we've, we've added new processes, right? I've highlighted those in this yellow dot, like, okay, our intake and confluence, our um, CICD pipelines and Jenkins, and the incorporation of Datadog, th those are all new things that weren't there before. But overall, our total lead time is down. So, so yeah, not only is lead time down, but we're actually adding value by uh, adding things like enterprise logging and tracking in Datadog. So RTE, if you're not doing scaled agile, I would say someone in the PMO office. So like probably like some, your lead program manager, you know, for, for your business unit would be a natural fit. And then as far as refresh or currency of this, you know, do you recommend quarterly after every PI, once a year? Yeah. So yeah, I, I recommend quarterly in general, but if you're working in scaled agile, um, I, t I tell, I don't tell, I, I coach the RTEs to, you know, mid, mid PI, which is usually three sprints in, um, he should try to get the, uh, the people that own these processes to share, um, what these numbers are. And th that way you can kind of scale it out and it's not just on one person at that point. And you you've got many people that get into the habit of providing this information twice, twice a quarter. I suppose you'd also want to update this if you're if you have a change to your operational value stream, you you know that may change one of these steps, and therefore your developmental value stream is going to change, and that and then you update both documents. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, if you're if you're creating an enhancement that changes how the customer interacts with with the service, yeah, that that definitely has trickle down effects to your development value stream. So, you know, I didn't use the term development value stream throughout the presentation, but this is a, you know, this is essentially, you know, if you're in, in scaled agile, this is a good mapping uh, or summary of, of your, your art, essentially. Um, and again, yeah, this is very simple for a specific product, but. Uh, yeah, that was, yeah, that was going to be kind of my follow on question was that absolutely this is what you're showing here is a development value stream, not an operational value stream, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. In that safe, <laughs> safe speak. <laughs> yeah, using safe speak. But, you know, to me, like, uh, you know, operational value stream, development value stream, or customer journey, like, I think those are all things, like, if you're an RTE, it's really good to, to know both so that you can uh, easily toggle between technical, when you're speaking with your technical teams and your, your business stakeholders really helps to be able to tie the two together. So yeah, that's a good call out. So, okay, where do we go from here? Um, what am I working on? Um, I'm actually building some tools. Um, not, I'm not building them in Lucid, but um, creating some tooling that will help people facilitate um, value stream mapping in their organization. So if you uh, stay connected with me on LinkedIn or send me an email, um, you know, I'll, I'll when I get that done, I'll uh, 
I'll let you guys know. And uh, yeah, I, I would love feedback. So uh, whether on this presentation or the, the tooling when I, when I get it finished. So any quick questions before I send you guys to the weekend? All right, this is a great group. Thank you guys for showing up and happy Friday and have a great weekend.